Gove, one of the Prime Minister's right-hand men in Cabinet, and, if you believe the press, currently a highly effective Whitehall Empire builder. Uh, Michael Gove, can I ask you, first of all, um, do you think that teachers should be safe in schools? Yes, teachers will be safe in schools. Uh, the programme that's been outlined is a staged and careful return uh, with children in reception year one and year six of primary uh, coming back to school, we hope, on the uh, week beginning the 1st of June. And it is the case that uh, some of the, uh, uh, the best leaders in uh, current education have said that it is absolutely safe for children to return, absolutely safe for teachers and other staff to return as well. Because on the other side of the equation, the British Medical Association has said that they don't think it will be safe. And it, uh, the case numbers in schools have to be much, much lower. Given that, can you guarantee teachers will be safe? Yes. Uh, it is the case, as I say, that um, the uh, I talked to the chief scientific advisor yesterday uh, okay. for the government, Patrick Valance, um, and running through the figures, the, the R number, uh, the rate of infection in the community overall, we're confident that children and teachers will be safe. Uh, the Children's Commissioner has outlined that uh, throughout this crisis we've had uh, nurseries adjacent to uh, hospitals remaining open. We haven't seen infection in them. We know, as we've just heard, that um, uh, uh, the only outbreaks that have occurred in schools have been when you've had a significant number of additional people uh, in a school okay. setting. They haven't occurred in okay. traditional classroom settings. So we can be confident that, provided the right measures are in place, that teachers and students will be safe. Uh, and that's why it's so important that we talk to the teachers who, of course, have been working incredibly hard throughout this period, teaching those children who have been in school, children of key workers and children from disadvantaged homes. OK, let's turn to the really important question, which is how? Because you've told everyone they must carry on socially distancing. Very difficult for small children. But how do you make classrooms, which used to be crammed with kids, safe going forward? Well, uh, we can learn from what other countries have done. Uh, Denmark is, uh, is one such, where children have returned uh, to primary school. Um, and it, it may have been the case in, in many of the primary classrooms that you or I might have visited in the last couple of years, that we'll have seen children working together in groups around a table. Children will have to be distanced now, sitting at desks in a way which might seem rather more traditional. Um, and we can do that by making sure that we have uh, staggered lunch breaks, staggered breaks for um, uh, uh, play, and we can have children arriving in a staggered fashion as well. And we can make sure that you have one adult per class and that you cap class sizes at 15. And you can be absolutely sure, given if class sizes are capped at 15, that means there aren't going to be enough rooms available in the traditional school, the traditional system. So therefore, are you going to have some system whereby kids maybe come in the afternoon and not the mornings, or on uh, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, but not Tuesdays? And Is that the kind of thing you're looking at? Well, the reason why we're only bringing back um, years, uh, reception year one and year six first is to ensure that we do have that space and that flexibility. And then we hope to be able to bring back more primary school children after that. But we're talking, obviously, to uh, academy school uh, 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 chain leaders uh, and to local authorities and others in order to make sure that we can get children to return, that classrooms can be used effectively, um, and that we can have one adult in that classroom with 15 or fewer children. And you can sit here and guarantee that no teacher is going to catch coronavirus as a result of going back to school? Well, the only way ever to ensure that you never catch coronavirus is to stay at home completely. The, 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 there is always, always, always um, in any loosening of these restrictions a risk of people catching the coronavirus. You're but but you could guarantee your safe, their safety, and it sounds like, from what you're saying, you can't really. Yes. It's, uh, it's but, a personal risk. Well, uh, the, the, the key thing is uh, that we can make these workplaces safe. You can never eliminate risk, but as we know, as we've heard, um, it, it is the case that it's extremely unlikely um, that uh, any school is likely to be the source of a, a, a COVID outbreak. Okay. Um, and, and if, for any reason... Uh, uh, there are risks, then we can take steps to mitigate them. So what do you say to councils like uh, Liverpool, Hartlepool, Greater Manchester, who've said, we've looked at the advice from the BMA, we've talked to the teachers, and we are not going to reopen on the 1st of June? Well, I'd respectfully ask them to think again, to broaden the range of scientific advice that they look at. Um, I know the BMA has the best interests of its members at heart, but actually the, the, the clear scientific and clinical advice is that it is safe to um, uh, have schools reopen, accompanied with social distancing. And the other thing that I would say in particular is, look, children only have one chance at education. Mm. Over the course of the last decade, we've made significant strides in closing the gap between the richest and the poorest in our schools. 
This lockdown has put that backwards. If you really care about children, you will want them to be in school, you'll want them to be learning, you'll want them to have new opportunities. So, um, uh, you know, look to your responsibilities. Do you see some kind of political anti-government agenda from the unions in this? Uh, no, I, I, I think the unions, entirely understandably, want to look after their members and they're, and they're being cautious. Um, but uh, I would encourage them to uh, think about uh, the, uh, the future of the children who are all uh, uh, our first concern. And I would urge them also to look at the science and to listen to uh, the scientists and clinicians, to look at foreign examples and, and to say, look, if progressive countries like Denmark can be uh, teaching children and have them back in schools, so should we. You know, the whole point about being a teacher is that you love your job. It's a mission. Um, a vocation to be able to so, excite young minds. So teachers want to be in the classroom. They also want it to be safe. We can keep them safe and we can get them doing the well, job they love. Isn't the truth? You say we can keep them safe, but you can't guarantee they won't catch coronavirus. Isn't the truth that teachers, like many other people, are going to have to take personal risk and go back to work? Weigh up the balance, weigh up the risks and decide to do that. Uh, well, I, of course, you can try to insulate yourself completely from any risk. You can stay at home and, and hope that um, uh, not only will you not catch a virus, but that you won't be exposed to other risks. The whole point about life is that you need to manage risk in a way that keeps people as safe as possible. And we know that school settings are not uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sources of infection that some have feared. We know that they can be uh, made safe um, and appropriate working places. And it is the case that, um, you know, uh, uh, people on the NHS front line, people who are providing us with our food, uh, people... Yeah, and they're catching coronavirus. Well, we are doing everything we can, of course, to reduce the infection rate um, and to reduce the number of cases. And okay. as we make progress, and we are making progress, mm -hmm. in keeping the R rate below one and in reducing the number of infections, so if okay. there is an outbreak, right. we, can, uh, we can test, track, trace and isolate, so the situation is now better. But, but we you... cannot have a situation where, um, you know, we uh, keep, keep our schools. economy and our schools and our public services continually closed down because the so health that, consequences of doing so would be, would be malign as well. We'll come on to those. But the truth is that you can't absolutely guarantee that teachers won't catch coronavirus and yet you need the schools to reopen. That is the truth. Well, uh, none of us, none of us can guarantee that uh, 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 anyone will be entirely free um, unless effectively they're perpetually imprisoned in their own home. Um, and therefore, what we need to do is to make sure that people are as safe as okay. possible. Um, and in any uh, widespread understanding of the word, uh, schooling for a limited number of children with social distancing is a safe environment. Let's turn to care homes where at the very, very least, 13,000 people have now died in care homes. Now, the government has said that it has placed a protective uh, bat, uh, ring around care homes right from the start. How did you do that? Well, we've followed the scientific advice at every stage in order to ensure that we can effectively uh, provide support for those working in care homes and effectively ensure that those in care homes um, uh, face the minimum amount of risk. So right at so the very beginning... protective ring work? Right at the very beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic, we specified that uh, there should be a restriction on those visiting uh, uh, care homes in order to keep people in care homes safe. And also, when we've been, um, over the course of the last few months, fighting the pandemic, we've given local authorities uh, more money, £3.2 billion, um, supplemented by an additional £600 million last week, in order for care homes to be able to to practice yes. um, appropriate infection control um, and to make sure that we, we deal with the challenges that this pandemic poses. Well, let me read you two people who are absolutely at the forefront of this. One is Jeremy Richardson, who's CEO of Four Seasons Healthcare, which is the UK's second largest healthcare provider. He said it's disingenuous of the government to say they were focused on care homes right from the start of the crisis. That clearly wasn't the case. And Professor Martin Green, who's chief executive of Care England, if there was a protective ring initiated by the government, it didn't feel like that for the people who are living and working in care homes. Well, I, I respect both of them. I mean, Jeremy Richardson is an um, outstanding businessman um, who's devoted um, an enormous amount of care and time to... And he felt no to, to, ...to helping um, uh, vulnerable people. And it's entirely understandable that they would, um, uh, anyone would with a conscience, always want more to be done to help the vulnerable. 
But I think it's important that we put these things in context. So uh, the number of people uh, being discharged from hospitals into care homes um, has been falling throughout this crisis and has been far less this year than last. But the people who were, who were in that position right at the beginning, some of them were infected with COVID-19. And you put people who were infected with COVID-19 out of hospitals and into care homes, and you knew that was happening. There was government guidance on two care homes until the 15th of April. And it read, some of these patients admitted to a care home may have COVID-19. Negative tests are not required prior to admissions in care homes. That was a terrible mistake. Well, let me say three things. Firstly, on testing, we've significantly increased the number of tests so that tests are now available for all those who are uh, symptomatic in care homes. The second thing is, yes, our guidance has altered over time, but that is as a result of our scientific understanding of the virus changing over time. And then the third thing, and this is the, the critical point, is the decision as to whether or not a patient is in a hospital or in another setting, a care home or home, is a clinical decision. And it is often the case um, that uh, uh, for a patient... Uh, it will be uh, far better for them. They will receive better care if they are in a care home than in hospitals. Because so hospitals... they may be affecting other people in well, the care home. Well, as the, a the, but the, the, the key thing is a clinical decision is made both about the patient and about the infection risk. Because in hospitals, okay. there is also a risk of infection as well, as we know. Um, and uh, hospital beds are there for people who require a particular type of intervention because they have an acute mm -hmm. problem. So. It is a difficult judgment to make, but it is one where okay. the clinician is in the lead. I don't dispute that it's difficult, but when you say clinicians are in the lead, ministers were warned back in 2017 in the Cygnus exercise that this was going to be a problem. The government's own assessment of this said there's going to be a problem in the care home sector if we take, uh, during a pandemic, people out of hospitals and put them into care homes, and the care homes may not be able to cope as they have not been able to cope. All of this has been proved. Ministers knew about it ahead of time. Well, this is the reason why um, we've had fewer people being discharged from a hospital into care homes this year than last. 40 per cent fewer. Um, that, that's one of the steps that we've taken. Respect, and also... It doesn't matter how many, if they've been infected with the COVID-19 no, no, no. when they go into the care no, homes. No, no, But th th this is the key thing. 40 per cent fewer overall, and at the same time, increased investment in the care home uh, uh, sector of the of the kind that I mentioned, the £3.2 billion, pounds, and at the same time, de deliveries of personal protective equipment, and at the same time, an increase in the provision of tests so that we now have more tests yes. in this country than any other European country. And also... It looks as if you're scrambling to catch up in care homes. Well, you're offering tests for everybody in care homes now, but what's the use of a single test? If I'm working in a care home mm. and I'm going in and out of that care home where there is COVID, 19 day after day after well, day. I need to be tested every day. Is well, that going to be offered by the government? Uh, we will. In we are increasing the number of tests, but one of the key things is that many of the people who are working in our care homes are not going backwards and forwards. Uh, they are uh, bravely and uh, uh, generously uh, making sure that they are mm. there on site in order to reduce the risk of infection. But something else as well. Um, international comparisons, as Professor Ian Diamond um, reminded us when he was on the programme, this programme, uh, uh, a week or so ago, um, are, are difficult. Um, provisional, uh, but it is the case, if we look at the proportion of people in the UK who've died in care homes, uh, that is significantly lower than the proportion of people um, in European countries who've died in care homes. Every death is a tragedy. Um, we are still living through this pandemic and there will be lessons to be learned, but I think it's also important that we look at this uh, situation in the round. Um, uh, now, mm. we, are, we, we have taken steps significant steps to improve the care of people in care homes. As I say, there will be a point in the future when all of us can look back and reflect and make sure that we've learned the appropriate lessons. But at the moment, we are focused on making sure that we beat the virus and protect people as effectively as possible. Um, and rightly so. But you talk about international comparisons. I can remember very vividly talking to a French minister right at the beginning of the COVID epidemic. And she said, we're really, really worried about what's going to happen in care homes. And the Swedish government has now come out and said, we made a terrible mistake with care homes. And, you know, around the world, governments are saying care homes have been a real problem. And I'm just asking you, do you accept the same thing has happened in this country? I, I accept that it is a particular challenge, yes. And uh, going back to um, the general election campaign in December, um, one of the points that um, we made then is we need fundamental reform of our social care sector. We need to build a political consensus yeah. and to change it. And there are big lessons to be learned. Um, and, and I think 
all countries, uh, for the reasons that you mentioned, know that we need to, okay. uh, with an ageing population um, and with um, uh, increased prevalence of, of dementia, think about how we look after our, our most vulnerable elderly, as well as others who are in care. Um, uh, we absolutely need to, but I think it's also important to bear in mind, um, as, 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 as you have, that uh, significant steps have been taken by okay. the health secretary and, and his team to do everything we can to protect people now. Is it right to start to ease the lockdown before we have full contact tracing? Uh, we should be easing the lockdown. We already are in particular areas. We need to make sure that we keep the R number below one. Um, but it is also the case that we're making progress um, in getting a test, track, trace and isolate system in place for the beginning of next month. And are we going to have the 18,000 tracers that we were promised? We were promised them now. Are we going to have them next week? Yes. Um, we have more than 17,000 people who've signed up. Trained? Uh, 17,200, a significant number of them already trained. Um, they will be in place. Um, again, it's a phenomenal effort. You know, uh, throughout this crisis, people have said, um, or in particular of the, the health secretary, he's been setting these ambitious goals, you know, 100,000 tests, mm. 18,000 contact tracers. He won't meet them. He has. You know, one of the really surprising so, I, things... I guess it would be slightly unfair, perhaps, and ask you whether 18,000 is nearly enough, because I've been looking around the world where they're doing tracing and testing and following up, and by and large, they need far, far more people. South Korea, far more people mm. than we're, we're recruiting. Do you accept, as a government, we may need to have a much larger army of tracers? Well, uh, I, the, the number that we have, the number that we've been advised are necessary. Um, there's a mixture of um, people who have clinical training and people who can provide a call centre service. But the, the point that I was going to make is that, of course, it's quite right to say, will it be enough? And it's quite right also to have challenged ministers to meet their targets. But the health secretary has. Um, Matt has ensured that the NHS right. was not overwhelmed. He's ensured that we are now testing more people than any other country. He's ensured that we have people now okay. being trained in order to do test, track, trace and isolate. And I think it's important. Yes, ministers, myself included, you know, uh, we're okay. open to criticism okay. and open to learn, but I think it's also fair that when a minister does well in the heat of battle, as the health secretary has, that that is recognised too. Well, let me ask you about Matt, as you call him, because he also said the government was doing work on why so many people, extra deaths, were happening during this that are not caused by COVID-19. Yes. Have you got any results on that? Is there anything you can tell me about why people are dying in such large numbers? Work is going on at the moment. Uh, and, of course, we need to look to see, is it the case that there are people who uh, are suffering from severe conditions who uh, should have presented for treatment who did not because of fear of infection. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a complex right. question, but it, but it takes us back to the central point, which is that, that there needs to be a balance between effective lockdown, but also the progressive easing of it, because right. um, a, a total lockdown has a malign effect on public health. It certainly does. Let me ask you a very simple question. How are the Brexit talks going? Um, I think, um, uh, well, but with one proviso. And the proviso is there's a big difference, philosophical difference, between um, uh, the position that, uh, that we take and the position that the European Commission take. The European Commission want us uh, to follow the rules even though we've left the club, sure. and the European Commission so saying... want to have the same access to our fish as uh, they had mm. uh, when we were in the right. EU, even though we're out. So when you say well, what do you mean is well, comma, but badly? No, I think that, that there's been a, a good conversation. I, I, I've had a good well, conversation with um, my counterpart, the Vice President of the Commission, um, about okay. making sure that the rights of citizens are protected. Um, okay. no, the, the, the challenge for the EU is um, uh, to show just a little bit of their okay. fabled flexibility. Thank you very much indeed, Michael Gove. Now, before we finish, a little cultural uplift in the form of poetry. Simon Armitage is the poet laureate and will shortly be reading us his poem about the lockdown. He's collaborated with the film star Florence Pugh and has set a recording of it to music.